Good afternoon. Several years ago, I attended a meeting at the State Council of Higher Education in Virginia at a time when Dr. Gordon Davies was the director of CHEV. A report had come out on faculty satisfaction and dissatisfaction, what were faculty especially happy about and what were faculty especially unhappy about across the Commonwealth of Virginia. At that time, and I will confess this is some years ago, but I think it could be true almost today, faculty had two major laments. There were too many committees and there were too many administrators. And Dr. Davies got up and said, isn't this a bit of a contradiction? Isn't one, in some sense, the antithesis to the other? The collective folks in the room pointed out that indeed what had really happened was a proliferation of governance work that was driving both sides of it. And I think that the consensus of that room might have been correct. I certainly know what I work on uh, and consider some fraction of it to be unfortunate that, that we need to do things. I know that as I go and sit on committees with many of you, uh, much of the work that we do seems uh, either unappreciated or underappreciated. But it's still very important work. Uh, this afternoon, I'm leaving for Atlanta to be a part of a committee for the Southern Association. And I will, by the end of this week, have been involved in the accreditation of over a dozen colleges in this region. And one of the things I've gotten a chance to look at is governance structures at other places. I have seen schools, private and public, wealthy and poor, I have been to some of the true garden spots of the South that I didn't know existed. Um, every time I go to one of these things, I come home and I'm glad for the governance system that we have here because I have seen some true disasters at other places. Just last week, we looked at a policy um, where one of the standards of accreditation is that there must be a published policy and the conclusion of our committee was, well, it's a published policy. The standard doesn't say it's got to be a good one. <laughs> um, and everybody that was on the committee lamented what the policy stated, but it was there. I give all of this as prelude to the conversation that we're about to have uh, with Professors Hilmar and Turner. Uh, there is a history to how we got to where we are. Um, at Randolph-Macon, that history being both local and national. And this year marks the 40th anniversary of important times at the college uh, in the development of our faculty governance system. And so in, in honor of that past and in anticipation of what we have to the future, uh, I offer you Professor Silmore and Turner. Thank you all for coming out at this time of year when it's difficult to get away from the papers that need, grade, need graded and all of that. Um, we would have done this on the actual date of the 40th anniversary of the faculty adoption of what is basically our current faculty handbook shared governance system, but we will be doing shared governance that day. We'll have our faculty meeting next, <laughs> next, next Wednesday. Uh, so what Greg and I have put together uh, is a little bit of a historical review, both national and locally, and then uh, hopefully a discussion, uh, raise some issues about constraints we face in effective shared governance uh, currently. This system of shared governance in the United States higher education system dates to the early 20th century, the current shape of it dates to the early 20th century, and I uh, found this uh, book by James McKean Cattell, a early psychologist, back when psychology was considered uh, a little bit more than phrenology, uh, and was fighting for its space in the sciences. Um, 
He wrote that a professor's salary should depend on the favor of a president or that he should be dismissed without a hearing by a president with the consent of an absentee board of trustees is a state of affairs not conceivable in an English or German university. Upton Sinclair, writing uh, about that quote uh, a little bit later, 1922, said that the reason for this is that the American university is not organized along the lines of American government, it's organized along the lines of American business, American corporate structure. The college is not a state, but a factory. Considering this, Sinclair then wrote that this brings us to the second demand, the first demand being that for academic freedom. The second demand of the college professor, not merely must he, of course, 1922, uh, we, were all, we were all he's, except for those that weren't, um, must have security in his job, must have collective control of that job, and he must say how the college shall be conducted, conducted and what higher education shall be. He mu this means he must take from the president and the board, uh, and his higher, the, take from the board and the hired man, the president, the greater part of their functions. So this is part of a, of a struggle going on in the early 20th century. We sometimes think of higher education and governance as sort of a guild, a medieval guild uh, uh, concept that you know, the faculty created these institutions and govern them, and slowly other factors began to Lead, uh, take control of the governance. Um, really, in the United States, governance was part of the labor movement. The demand for governance was part and parcel of uh, the rise of labor unions uh, and in, in higher education, the creating of the creation of a set of principles <coughs> by which the faculty ought to be involved in the governance. The AUP. The AUP was founded uh, this were in the centennial year of the founding of the AAUP, American Association of University Professors. And the the origin story, the origin myth of the AUP is the 1900 firing of an economist at Stanford University. Uh, this economist had certain opinions about uh, immigrant rights and uh, uh, monopoly railroads. His opinions were not well received by a certain prominent member of the Stanford community, Mrs. Lee Stanford, uh, and had him fired in 1900. Faculty governance may be many things, but it is not quick. 1915, uh, after Arthur Lovejoy had been thinking about this for 15 years, uh, organized a meeting at Johns Hopkins to uh, consider an organization to defend academic freedom. And that was the creation of the AUP. Uh, the principles, the key principles were that tenure and shared governance are the bulwark of academic freedom. Why tenure? Tenure provides the freedom to teach and research and speak without fear of losing your job, as one of the previous slides had. I didn't comment on it, but uh, you know, don't have to fear that a rumor is spreading that the board, a board of trustees member has asked whether you might be a Bolshevik. That could lead to your firing. Um, why do we need academic freedom? The concept of academic freedom is to uh, serve the public good. The higher education should be a place where ideas are explored, even crank ideas perhaps are explored, and through the full light of, of uh, debate and investigation are either rejected as a deep crank or, in fact, accepted as, as uh, an advance in, in our knowledge. 1915, the AAUP established Committee A, which is academic freedom, and then in 1916, established Committee T, which is shared governance. I don't know why T. Uh, about the time I was getting involved in the AAUP, the AAUP get, uh, switched from this a letter system for the committees to actually just naming the committee. So now it's the Committee on the Governance of Universities and Colleges. Um, some, some members, sort of like those who, uh, have, even after Vatican II, still attend Mass in Latin, some AUP <laughs> members still refer to uh, the committees by their letters. Uh, and me 
being the younger generation, I don't speak Latin, and I don't understand the commit, the, the, what committee they're referencing. But anyway, this committee was established to uh, study institutional go governance because it was identified as a principal <coughs> defense of academic freedom, that faculty have a role in this process. Over the years, the common law, as, as the AEP likes to reference it, developed uh, regarding uh, the role of the faculty and the uh, administration and the board in the governance principle and the government process. And in 1966, this common law was codified in the statement, um, statement on government of colleges and universities. It is included in the uh, pamphlet of key documents along with the 1940 statement on academic freedom that are on your table. If you want to take those, please do. Um, this is a joint statement by the AUP, the uh, American Council on Education, and the Association of Governing Boards. So it's not entirely faculty saying this is what we believe. It is the governing boards, their national association, the uh, institutions through the Council of, on Education have all signed on to these principles. I will read, well, it created the, the concept of various responsibilities, primary responsibility for the faculty in certain areas, beginning with the curriculum, uh, a joint responsibility in certain areas where administrative concerns and faculty concerns intersect, and then a third area where the faculty should be informed of and consulted about certain things but that are not in the primary responsible areas of responsibility. Um, this structure is found in the faculty handbook, which we'll turn to, I believe, but We'll turn to right now. <laughs> so I get to move actually from the from the, the global slash national uh, down to the local. So um, and we're going to uh, take a look at a couple uh, events. Uh, and as with many histories, uh, these are selected events uh, as we're going through uh, these things to, to uh, take a look at what actually has happened. Um, and I must uh, recognize actually uh, my, my two sources for most of this information. Uh, obviously, the, um, uh, Dr. Scanlon's book, um, the more recent uh, edition of that, uh, that covers this particular chunk of time was, was absolutely uh, crucial in my understanding at least of, of all of this that was going on. Uh, and then actually uh, in September, uh, last semester, the history department uh, uh, sponsored uh, an event that uh, discussed many of the, these same events, actually. Uh, as we'll see as we're going through this, uh, many of these things happened actually in that September sort of time frame in 73. Um, and, you know, that were then uh, uh, came to fruition uh, in May that we are now celebrating the, the 40th uh, anniversary of. So uh, both of these actually were, were crucial sort of pieces uh, again, from my understanding of how, uh, how all of this uh, uh, goes together. So, um, and in the idea that things uh, often happen slowly, um, <laughs> we can start with uh, a 1967 uh, faculty meeting. Uh, a motion was made to appoint a committee to determine the qualifications for voting membership uh, in faculty meetings and so forth. Uh, it was the, the first uh, reference, at least that I heard and saw, of, of uh, a lot of this. Um, that motion failed uh, in the faculty meeting. Um, so we then move forward, uh, again at the speed of faculty to 1970, um, <laughs> where a faculty committee was formed to draft, actually, a faculty constitution. Uh, and to dr draft sort of uh, ideas and how uh, structure and so forth might work uh, in, in those faculty meetings. Um, which, uh, to quote the book, this led nowhere. Um, moving forward again uh, to 1972, there was a committee on the faculty constitution uh, reported uh, again, quoting that the advantages of flexibility and informality should not be sacrificed in order to establish a formal legal set of structures. Um, you know, was was sort of the the idea that uh, you know the casual conversation might be better than, than any sort of uh, uh, formal kind of structure there. 
Um, this actually uh, caused a, an objection to be raised during the faculty meeting that this was, uh, that was reported. Uh, and that objector actually made a motion to adopt a draft constitution uh, that would provide, again, this sort of, uh, this sort of structure, um, regardless of the fact that the committee had uh, said, well, golly gee, we don't really want or need that. Um, that motion was defeated. So, uh, so that was February of 1972. Uh, a little while later, uh, the faculty, in a faculty meeting, uh, a vote was taken to uh, approve uh, a particular summer program uh, during the summer. Uh, and that, uh, that vote actually resulted in a tie vote that was uh, broken actually by the dean voting uh, as the dean is allowed to do in tie kind of uh, uh, situations. So that this summer program actually was, uh, was approved. Uh, this was, estimates that uh, the vote would have failed substantially uh, without administrative members' votes. Okay. Now this gets back to, again, going back to 1967, the idea that uh, 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 administrators at this point were voting in faculty members and were allowed to vote uh, on all of the issues that were coming up uh, in, in, uh, within, the, within the faculty uh, uh, sort of jurisdiction. Uh, kind of idea. Um, a motion following this was made that only faculty and the registrar uh, should be allowed to vote on matters uh, dealing with academic credit. Right. So the idea that we as faculty are responsible for uh, this part of things. Um, that motion passed. So that was approved. Uh, by the by the by the at the at this particular faculty <coughs> meeting, um, President White then stood up and announced that he regretfully uh, overruled the vote. Think about that. Uh, and I, I, here's another one of these quotes that I love: "The minutes do not capture the dead black silence, the utter stillness that the president's sentence produced." Uh, and, and I think we can all certainly, uh, you know, relate to uh, relate to that that kind of uh, that kind of situation, uh, and what that would uh, what that would bring. So, uh, move forwarding a couple of uh, to the actually this was in November, so then. The, this uh, 1973 February would have been the next faculty meeting uh, in the in the year. Uh, a motion came from the AUP chapter that uh, pre the president should seriously abide by the vote was that was taken, uh, i.e., that uh, the faculty and the registrar were the were the, the primary people responsible for uh, anything to do with the academic uh, uh, academic credit. Uh, so there was a motion made. Um, President White basically said, ah, no, sorry, you guys are out of luck. I mean, for all intents and purposes, it really was uh, that, that basic a, uh, a, res a response. Uh, to point out, actually, that, that this debate uh, uh, was not the only issue going on at the moment uh, in this same faculty meeting, actually, uh, in other business, the president reported that salary discussions had been put on the back burner after five years of discussion. So there had been no movement in, fa in salary discussions or any sort of thing, and oh gee, we're just going to not pay any attention to that uh, anymore uh, after five years of, of going, uh, going nowhere. Um, the president also reported uh, that uh, the academic calendar uh, when classes started, when they stopped, uh, all of the sort of things uh, uh, dealing with the academic part of the, uh, of the school um, was his responsibility and that the faculty was not consulted at all in those, uh, in those deliberations or uh, figuring out what the, what the calendar would actually, uh, would actually be. So, you know, part of this is, is there are several pieces of things going on here uh, all, at the, all at the same time. Uh, well, now we move forward to, to August, uh, when the president of the chap, uh, AAUP uh, sent out a, a letter to the faculty uh, outlining uh, 
these sorts of events that had, that had happened over the, the last, in this case, uh, uh, five years or more, uh, and proposing, actually, that uh, the faculty would authorize a collective bargaining agreement uh, election, i.e., uh, the faculty could uh, uh, decide whether they wanted to be represented uh, as a collective bargaining uh, unit uh, with, the, with the college. Uh, according to the, the Herald Progress, again quoting from Dr. Scanlon's book here, a uh, central issue was the lack of faculty participation in the decision-making process uh, at Randolph-Macon College. There it goes. A wee while later, um, September 23rd, uh, President White actually sent a, a memo uh, entitled Academic Government at Randolph-Macon College uh, to the faculty. Uh, sent this out uh, to everybody involved. And you'll notice actually the date is important. Uh, well, the, the quote here is this was a sweeping concession on the matters of faculty governance. Uh, the date here is important because on September 27th, uh, there was actually a, uh, a, a vote on whether to accept AAUP actually as the collective bargaining agent uh, for, the, for the faculty. So uh, this was supervised uh, by the NRB. Uh, the vote ended up being 38 against and 28 for the proposal. So uh, this proposal did not pass. Uh, there were one blank. Uh, there was one blank vote and two votes that were challenged in the course of that. Uh, and as Dr. Scanlon points out, six votes actually would have changed the outcome of that election. So, uh, it was a, a very, very uh, close kind of uh, situation in that sort of thing. Uh, move forward to October, the next faculty meeting. In fact, uh, a motion was made that asserted that any system of academic governance must be created by the faculty uh, and responsible to the faculty. Uh, and following that, then a committee was elected to draft a document that spelled out how that system would, uh, would actually work. Right? So even though you know, the, the uh, AEUP was not uh, 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 selected as a collective bargaining agreement, certainly the ideas on which uh, you know, the, the discussion had happened were, were, uh, were certainly being, being treated here. Uh, this was a special committee on academic governance, uh, and uh, these actions were in fact at that point supported by uh, President White uh, going forward. So October, now to May uh, 1974, uh, the final report of, of uh, was re was presented to the faculty, and again, the reference you know to uh, will be actually in a faculty meeting next week, which will be the uh, uh, the the forty actual fortieth anniversary of uh, of when this report was uh, uh, presented. Uh, must be faithfully implemented by the faculty and the administration in order for this to work. Uh, and the underlying principle here again was to uh, clarify the role of faculty in the system. Uh, and the important part here is not to discount anybody else's responsibilities, but to, uh, to really uh, codify, if you will, what, who was responsible for what uh, in, in, our particular, uh, in our particular situation. Uh, all of this was based very much on the language of uh, AAUP and of the ideas and so forth uh, that uh, have been you know, held as, uh, as the AAUP ideas uh, all along, um, which as Brian pointed out earlier actually uh, says that the faculty does have primary responsibilities uh, in certain areas. Uh, and this was uh, you know, accepted by the faculty and by the administration uh, in May of 1974 as sort of the uh, governing principles by which uh, the shared governance actually works. So now, fast forward 40 years later, and I'll toss the baton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
For the this final part, I just want to consider some of the challenges we face in shared governance. Uh, as Provost Franz mentioned, uh, uh, the, the problem of too many committees and too many administrators. How do we, how do we confront these kinds of challenges? Um, I suppose that some of the institutions with which I'm familiar, uh, administrators feel like they need to wear armor to, <laughs> to the meetings. Like Provost Franz, uh, I have a lot of contact with uh, people, at, uh, uh, other AUP members at campuses across the country, and I usually come back to Randolph-Macon thinking that our situation, our, our system works pretty well. It's not without its uh, uh, difficulties, uh, but we do not have uh, the same kinds of complexities that institutions that, uh, such as public institutions that are simply bigger and have other constituencies involved, um, but also we actually work fairly well with our administration. <coughs> the faculty handbook. Your faculty handbook <coughs> is in many ways an AUP document, as Greg pointed out. Uh, section 5.1.3 dis defines the meaning of primary responsibility, uh, that decisions of the faculty are binding except in rare instances. And in those instances, the uh, administration should explain to the faculty why it is not in agreement with the faculty decision and provide the faculty an opportunity to respond. The, unlike uh, President White, you can't just say no uh, because that is your, your sense of it. You need to give the other body, the other entity, an opportunity to consider your, your veto. Now, we're not a legislature. We're not a system of, of equal and separate powers. The Board of Trustees is the legal entity that governs the institution. This is true across, across the country in the uh, uh, not-for-profit world. The uh, administration is appointed by the board to, to affect the mission of the college. Um, and the faculty is not the governing body. So this is not a self-enforcing set of rules. So responsibility is not authority. Having the responsibility does not automatically assign you that authority. This statement is meant to provide <coughs> some guidelines by which authority can be taken by the faculty and protected from having other entities take it away, take that authority away. Some of the barriers we might face, uh, academic, uh, faculty culture can get in the way of, of, self go of, of excuse me, of shared governance. Um, the AUP statement on professional ethics, which is also part of our faculty handbook, section 3.1, uh, professors accept their share of faculty responsibilities for the governance of their institution. The title of the talk today, Pulling Our Weight, references that we need to show up, and we do. Um, it's now been a good number of years, but uh, when I was on the executive committee, we conducted a review of the number of uh, committee seats we have, and we, were, we had about twice as many as any other institution that I looked at. And most of those seats actually get filled. They're not just placeholders. We do participate uh, and it's going to be very burdensome. Many of my colleagues at other places are shocked to learn how much we spend time at governance. But And some of it's maybe not the best use of our time, but it's important that we participate. Um, the AUP statement on the relationship of faculty governance to academic freedom. All these statements, many of them, not all of them, are brought together in our big red book. Let Mal have the little red book. We have a big red book. Um, the collection of, of most of our uh, AAP reports. Some of them are purely faculty guidelines. Uh, others have the status of joint statements. Uh, again, serving as the common law of higher education. This statement on the relationship of governance to academic freedom uh, includes some considerations such as faculty must respect the views of the offbeat and cranky among its members. I like that phrase. It's, it's an invitation to 
avoid the isolation of certain points of view. Academic freedom then, again, is about hearing and airing the, the ideas of others. Some of those ideas may be shown repeatedly to be cranky. Others may be shown to be on the money and embraced if they're, they're heard. So faculty culture has to be a culture that is accepting of the principle of shared governance from its end. It's also the question of who exercises that authority. The increasing use of contingent faculty, meaning people who are not on the tenure track, hired for term contracts, one year, three years, uh, or part-time adjunct faculty, uh, as members of the professor professoriate have grown in these categories, the question is raised of, of who's actually doing the governance. I would, do we now have a system of Brahmins and Dalits in which the Brahmin class, the, the few remaining tenured and tenure track people uh, are burdened with and privileged with the opportunity to engage in governance and the vast majority of the professoriate are not so engaged and indeed in some cases prohibited from participating. This table shows the, pers this is from the, this year's um, salary, salary report. <coughs> I'm watching to see if Rich will spit on the way out. Uh, <laughs> he threatened that he might sh express his dissent at some point. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, from the, this year's sa uh, AUP annual sal salary report. Um, by the way, is a great service that the AAP provides, uh, collecting these data. Um, and we see, as it turns out, in this 40-year period since the Randolph-Macon faculty adopted its governance system, the growth of uh, various categories of employees in, in higher education. Full-time tenured and tenure-track faculty has grown by 23%. We're talking about individuals in 40 years. <laughs> Non-full-time, uh, non-tenure, uh, excuse me, full-time, non-tenure track faculty, third from the left, 259%. Part-time faculty have grown in numbers 286%. See some of the other categories there. This is a different way of looking at it uh, instead of percentage growth over time. This is the percentage share of the various categories. Probably a little bit hard to see, but on the far left, is the decline in the percentage of instructional staff in higher education institutions. In 1975, 29% were tenured and 16% were on the tenure track. <coughs> now in uh, 2009, only 16.8% were uh, tenured and 7.6% on the tenure track. The huge growth has been in particularly part-time faculty as well as non-tenure track faculty. So the professoriate has changed dramatically in these 40 years since uh, Randolph-Macon adopted shared governance system. Randolph-Macon does not track exactly this way, um, but this is the environment in which nationally um, mm -hmm. governance and academic freedom has to operate. There are external challenges. Uh, this is kind of a list, it's not a complete list. Um, External challenges to uh, shared governance come from a variety of sources. Corporatization of higher education, it's a, a phrase we like to use a lot in the AUP. Uh, that can take the form of industry financing of academic research and make, uh, trying to uh, put proprietary claims on that research, uh, uh, either for patent purposes or for uh, basic research that is controlled by a, a corporation. This is a a problem in, in pharmaceutical research and in other areas. Um, a faculty side, financial conflicts of interest where faculty may engage in research that um, in which they themselves are a investor in the process. So undermining the academic freedom once you to pursue truth where it leads you when you have a financial interest you may wish to, to control the research for certain Ends. Again, pharmaceutical research has come up with, uh, it has turned up these kinds of concerns. Uh, faculty, public institution perhaps, 
uh, engaged in research in which they themselves have a real interest in the results saying, hey, this medicine works really well. Um, also, corporatization can be found in the way we manage higher education. Uh, in 1915 and, in, and nationally and in 1976 at Randolph-Macon and in 19, uh, 2014 at Randolph-Macon, we're a fairly simple operation. Uh, when the provost's office was reviewed earlier this year by the provost at uh, Illinois Wesleyan, he was telling us about how Illinois Wesleyan has farms. We don't have any farms. We don't manage cows. We don't have these kinds of complexities. We don't have a medical school. We don't have a hospital. So the, the kinds of complexity in higher education, we don't rent out housing uh, on any major basis. Uh, we, we don't, we're not a landlord to a significant uh, uh, population, uh, other than our students, of course. The, uh, so the complexity of Randolph-Macon is still, uh, we're still a pretty simple operation. But this business management in all these other arenas in higher education sometimes manifests itself in the actual academic arena. And of course, I couldn't resist uh, uh, mentioning the lack of uh, President Sullivan at the University of Virginia a couple of years ago. She didn't have, as one of the board members for uh, termed it, strategic dynamism in mind, where the institution like the University of Virginia, Mr. Jefferson's University, could turn on a dime and embrace new opportunities like the now fading uh, interest in MOOCs. <laughs> <laughs> Politicization. Um, this can take uh, uh, can be found in a variety of places. Uh, you may have read recently about the state legislature in South Carolina seeking to punish the College of Charleston for assigning a reading that uh, uh, on LGBT themes for its freshmen. Um, this kind of thing has popped up in North Carolina some years ago for uh, the reading of uh, Barbara um, Aaron Reich's Nickel and Dime as a summer reading. Often it doesn't go very far. Most legislators in most states, you may be surprised to hear this, but most legislators in most states are fairly reasonable people and understand that if you go down this road, you may open up the door to all kinds of efforts to control the institution. But that doesn't prevent some for, from trying and sometimes getting close to succeeding. Uh, lots of, there have been threats to budget cuts for various kinds of programs. Uh, um, uh, legal assistance programs, environmental law assistance programs have been threatened. Um, certain kinds of programs, um, women's studies or uh, other kinds of programs, Native American studies have been threatened. Faculty expression. Uh, currently there is a movement, the AUP is opposed to this movement, uh, uh, to boycott Israel as a divestment uh, and forced divestment of, uh, from Israeli-owned firms by higher education institutions. Um, you know, the AUP is opposed to boycott, boycotts on, on the uh, principle of academic freedom. Uh, nevertheless, some legislatures have sought, the Illinois legislature for one, has sought to um, punish the University of Illinois for having faculty that, are support, that support this, uh, this divestment movement for being pro-Palestinian. Um, alumni and donors who might withhold support in protest of faculty expre uh, expression. What was the example you gave when we were talking here? Um, I know. Oh, oh not, not signing checks. Yeah, oh, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah that, that of donors and a certain, uh, certain group of donors are unhappy that their institution appeared on the list of institutions that are not doing a good job of address, addressing um, sexual assault are sending in checks without signing them as a form of protest. And of course that's perfectly acceptable behavior but institutions find themselves buffeted by these kinds of, of donor response. When it's focused on a faculty member who's published a particularly controversial book or has engaged again in um, uh, uh, questions regarding uh, the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, that can generate a chilling effect on academic freedom and on the capacity of the, the faculty con to control its own internal affairs. Other kinds of pressure groups, ACTA, anybody know what ACTA is? The uh, 
now I'm forgetting what A is, Association? American. American Council on Trustees and Alumni, which is neither an organization of trustees or alumni. Well, I guess there might be alumni somewhere. Um, it's, a, it's a political group, that, very, a conservative political group that seeks to um, uh, affect the curricula of higher education institutions. Uh, there was a report two years ago by ACTA about Virginia that included Randolph-Macon. Uh, Randolph-Macon was found to not be a very good school because our history program is way too full of history and not enough American history <laughs> and, and the, you know, the way that ACTA thinks it should be done. There are lots of groups like this and again we live in a free society where people have the opportunity to, to engage in these kinds of activities but it is a challenge for shared governance and higher education. There are also legal barriers. Um, the, uh, and I don't want to spend much time on this, but Yeshiva was a case in 1980 that the result of which made what happened at Randolph-Macon in 1973 virtually impossible. After Yeshiva, after the Supreme Court ruled in Yeshiva, the uh, court found that faculty are managerial employees. Because of shared governance, faculty are managerial employees and therefore are not subject to the National Labor Relations Act, meaning faculty cannot form unions in private sector institutions. Some private, uh, had, private institution faculty had unionized before Yeshiva in 1980. Um, some of them continue to be unionized, but after 1980, it'd be very, very difficult for a private sector um, faculty to unionize. Uh, public sector is different because that's governed by state law. Garcetti versus Ceballos, a uh, 2006 decision that some have interpreted to mean that faculty cannot speak in, on matters of academic governance in opposition to administration positions as essentially insubordinate, that, that, that would be insubordination. Even though the Garcetti, the uh, concurring opinion to Garcetti had attempted to carve out a protection for academic freedom in higher, ed higher education, this case wasn't a higher education case, it was a police force case. Um, even though that, that protection was included in the decision, um, other courts have not seen that and said that, ac that faculty, their protection to speak is greatest in areas in which they know least about, which is an invitation to faculty to, to bloviate on many things, but not talk about things that presumably they know a lot about, which is the governance of the curriculum, of the selection of other faculty to join, to, to teach the courses that are being offered. And internal challenges, bad administrations. None of this is self-enacting. It requires the goodwill on the part of an administration and the insistence on the part of the faculty uh, demanding our place in order to uh, assure that shared governance actually happens. The AUP has two lists. One is the censure list of uh, institutions that have violated academic freedom of either individual faculty or whole groups of faculty. Uh, Grove City College is at the top, as the longest, and I believe it is worn proudly on the sleeve at uh, Grove City, that they are on the A, that it is on the AUP censure list. And then AUP has a sanction list for institutions that infringe uh, shared governance principles. It's a much shorter list. Um, the last two cases, Rensselaer and Idaho State, were cases where the uh, administration did away with the faculty senate most institutions, as you know, have a faculty senate, and then replaced it with some mixed body that the administration could dominate. And the reason at Rensselaer that the, that the administration did away with the faculty senate was because that faculty senate was at attempting to give voting rights and participation rights to full-time contingent faculty. And the administration didn't want that to happen, did not want those people, that category of, of faculty to, to have the right to participate in shared governance. So even when a, the Brahmins were inviting others in, the administration was opposed. 
And I think that leads us to that. So we do have some time for questions, comments, considerations you might wish to share with us. Yeah, okay. um, I'm curious, does, uh, does our board of trustees, for conversation's sake, does our board of trustees know some of this history? Um, do we have any relationship to it? Do they have any position on it? There, um, there was actually a, a, a quote in, the, in uh, uh, Dr. Scanlon's book, actually, that uh, pointed out that uh, there were several decisions, at least right after the, the vote and so forth, that, that certainly would appear that they moderated their tone, if you will, uh, because of the, the threat or the, the idea that this could still come back around. So, uh, you know, right after the vote and so forth, yes, I would say definitely that was very high in their, uh, in their considerations. I, I can't speak to whether, how much they pay attention to it now. Do we train our trustees? So, well, <laughs> they, they get orient, they get an orient, the trustees receive orientation. Uh, I don't know the content of the orientation. I'm sure it is not a full review of shared governance. I can answer a little bit, Maria. Brian, do you get a session with the, the new trustees? I do not. You do not, okay. I get an hour with new trustees as a part of this orientation. I give them the faculty handbook. I invite them to read the section on shared governance. Now, many of these folks are Randolph making alumni. I don't know if they'll do the reading now. <laughs> um, but, but they're certainly afforded that opportunity and, and we point out what's there uh, so that they understand it. I think our trustees to ask if they collectively know it would be like asking if we collectively as a faculty know it. Right. Um, there are some who know it well. There are some who know it not at all. There are some who are indifferent. I think you would find the spectrum of trustees much like the spectrum of faculty. Um, we've been privileged, in my opinion, for the last dozen years, the Academic Affairs Committee of the Board has been led by Doug Ford, who was a college faculty member, was a college administrator, was executive secretary of Phi Beta Kappa, uh, has been a campaigner uh, regarding this group that Brian has referenced called ACTA, uh, about academic freedom. So to the extent that Doug has been able to hold sway with a number of trustees, um, I think we're in very good shape with regard to our trustee relations and their understanding of policy. Um, but, you know, that's my take on things. I have read, in fact, in the board of trustee meetings within the last year, I have read statements by at least one trustee who said, quote, the faculty have too much power around here. So, yes, it's a large group. You, you, you can't poll people, but right. Clearly, some of us powerful faculty kind of said, that. <laughs> yeah. I do know that in the state, uh, the boards of members of boards of visitors uh, receive an orientation, and at the last orientation last year, the uh, Rick Legon, who is the uh, president of the Association of Governing Boards, was part of that orientation and informed. Boards of visitors in Virginia that they should be prepared to fall on their sword for academic freedom. I don't know how many are eviscerating themselves. Yeah. Yes. I'd like to follow up on something Michael Fishbach just said. The 70s were much worse than you could portray. It's not a criticism of you because it was outside of what you were trying to do. The trustees were allowed no contact with the faculty. Mm -hmm. As a result, it was very easy to demonize the faculty. And demonize the faculty, some people did. There was one trustee in particular who seemed to have a visceral anger And so Michael said there was just one person, that one person can drive the whole. 
there was a very telling remark in a report from the Academic Affairs Committee to the full board. They had met members of the faculty and were surprised <laughs> at how pleasant and nice they were. <laughs> So I think it is far more important that you may, than you may realize that when you get invitations to meet with trustees that you go and talk to, not try to persuade them of anything in particular, let them get to know you. You're very talented people and let, let them get to know you. Let them just get a sense of you in an informal way. That way, you, you build a very important body of support. Uh, things were very, very difficult here in the summer. Very difficult. The school almost closed. That's what it Abby? Thank you for this. And following up on Maria's question, does the newer body of faculty get any insights as to the significance of the AADP? Do they get any information in terms of their lengthy orientation? And then what opportunities are for faculty to be more involved with the AADP? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, the orientation for new faculty is pretty crowded. I, th I think it's gotten a little less crowded in recent years. Um, and I, you know, I've thought about, gee, it'd be great to get the AEP in there, but you know, orientations are when you're trying to figure out where you're living and, and it, you get shower with information. It's really up to the chapter uh, to reach out to people uh, and, and make them aware of the AEP. Certainly, awareness of AEP is declining, partly driven by the contingency and, and those forces. I was when we attended the session uh, that the history department sponsored uh, in September, I was shocked to learn that something like 50 <coughs> to 60 of the faculty, faculty members, of which would have been a somewhat smaller faculty, were members of AUP in 1973. Um, that's certainly not the case anywhere in the country, uh, it, uh, certainly outside of collective bargaining chapters. Uh, every, uh, every year at the national AUP meeting, 50-year members are recognized, and you see that list of 50-year members, and most of them are from Research One institutions, um, you know, all the IVs and the, the, the flagship institutions. The current people attending the AEP meetings are people from, and there's nothing wrong with this, but from Randolph-Macon, from uh, 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 regional research institutions and the like. Research One faculty are of are now live in a culture of discipline, research, publishing, and do not have, many of them, do not have a sense of a shared um, a membership in the professoriate. When the University of Virginia had its crisis uh, a couple years ago, many of the UVA people looked around and said, you know, we, we were asleep at the wheel. We were not participating in governance and we were too busy with our own activities and now now we realize what can happen if we uh, let things slip away let authority slip away from us i've rambled some i didn't answer oh and making the you know I, so i think fewer people fewer young faculty are aware of the aup we need to do a better job of, of making them aware of it as a responsibility really to to the professoriate at large um, after them, Mike. Um, at any ten teaching institution, the faculty are the face of that enterprise, but the demographics have changed here, and now behind the scenes, there are more than 100 full time staff people who help make this place what it is. And I would be interested in any sort of take you have on what the role of uh, shared governance with faculty has done to empower staff or what it could do or how that relationship has changed over time and, and anything related to that. Yeah, um, Greg and I were discussing that this morning. Um, all of this, of course, is the, 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 the argument for shared governance is it goes to that argument for academic freedom, which is that the institution is dedicated to serving the public good by pursuing truth. 
certainly staff supports that mission. Some staff are closer to the actual, uh, I don't want to word this carefully, are closer to the actual pursuit of truth in their own activities, professional staff. Others are perhaps a, you know, a step removed from that, still supporting the larger uh, 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 goal of the institution. In many places, professional staff are part of the faculty in one way or another. In other places, professional staff are not part. At Randolph-Macon, librarians are considered faculty. In other places, <coughs> librarians might be considered professional staff. Um, Greg clicked up the information about the registrar being included as uh, a voting member of the faculty on certain kinds of issues. Is the reg what is the role of the registrar? The registrar assists the faculty in the assigning of, of credit, the, the, the very central part of our mission. So defining the boundary around who is the faculty or who, who is it that is, ought to be part of this governance structure is, and it's not written in stone, it's not the definition of the faculty uh, that is handed down from you know, some legislative body. It's uh, up to the faculty and in collaboration with staff to create those, those opportunities for participation in governance. Staff need to demand that then place at the table as well. Right. Yeah. yeah, Mike. Uh, so I guess I would preface this by saying I'm, I'm trapped in my own body and mind. I thought that when I was scientist, I asked a lot of questions. I asked why and those kind of things. So I'm curious to you know, like, why Luther White was the way he was. But that's a question <laughs> for James after today, my <laughs> after this meeting, but the, the, uh, the question I have for us is why would a faculty member, what are the incentives for a faculty member pulling our way, demanding our place? I, you've made a very good case for um, why in terms of the greater good and protecting the truth. But I know there's also some more tangible benefits associated with having a, a bigger service load part of our professional career. And the service loads change from institution to institution. And the data you show where, you know, full-time faculty going down, betting that's inversely correlated with the workload of full-time faculty. So what, does the AAUP address tangible benefits in addition to some of the more ethical components? What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and, and don't, I mean, you know, and there's also, we do a ton of service stuff here. Yes, yes. yeah. Um, I want to, you know, certainly for me at least, the, uh, the benefits are, are to the greater good to a large extent for us, particularly here. Uh, we at the moment do enjoy a, a fairly good relationship with, uh, with our administration and so forth. However, that has not always been the case. Uh, and if we are not um, um, rather vigilant, I think, then you know, we could uh, find ourselves back in, back in the bad old days, if you will. Um, it, one of the things, again, that I was struck with with both the meeting in September and then going back through uh, and uh, doing a little research for this was the fact that um, probably about two-thirds of the faculty were members of AAUP. Uh, back in those days, and in fact, the um, the, the president of AAUP had uh, standing meetings with uh, with the president uh, often. Um, and I've been chapter president now for six years, two terms, I think. Now, never once have graced uh, 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 Bob's door as as, uh, as as part of AAUP. Uh, that has changed, you know, in in these forty years. Um, you know, I think the, the but but we need to be vigilant that that uh, you know is uh, remains but the case. What I was steering this conversation though is yeah. is um, more about remuneration. So if if workload is fifty percent, it does a you address the balance between workload and, and remuneration. So but that if the workload is fifty percent service, but we're getting evaluated, you know. Well, I mean that that, that varies from institution to institution, of course. The what the AUP provides is the, as, as I like to say, the common law of higher education. We would, if, 
if there were no AAUP, we might argue for, and in some cases might get, a role in shared governance, certain policies that we would like to see in place, protection for scientists, for intellectual property rights and the like. We might get those things, but it would not be, we, we would not have this to reference saying, this, this is what best practices are. Producing this requires that there be AEP committees, which are staffed by people like us, which uh, uh, work for free as part of their service or professional activity. Um, but they're staffed by the national office. Somebody's got to print this up. So the membership dues go largely to producing things like this, to producing the knowledge and information that we use to then fight our battles on campus. Uh, that's the main thing you get, and that's, a, that's an intangible, I assure you. The faculty salary is probably the best known product of AUP, the salary survey. Um, and you know, that gets used to then take to administrations and boards about their, your status uh, and why it needs to be addressed. Again, it's information. What, what we get back is information that we can then use. For $18 a year, you can also get a rather uh, a small life insurance policy. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the tangibles like that are small. Seeing no further questions, I thank you all for, for joining us. Thank you.